Okay, so I know that in the program it was written that I will talk only about private information retrieval, but I decided that's not the best solution for this. Okay, maybe we can decide together. And I will present you a bunch of cryptographic protocols that may help with privacy in, in the setting of content routing. So this is kind of uh, more of a exploratory talk. I, I'm not sure any of the solution will solve the problem, so I'm very happy to brainstorm. So feel free to ask questions and interrupt me or give suggestions. Um, just to set up the actors, so we had um, this morning uh, the talk by Juan. We have the content providers, the content consumers, and the content routers, uh, and each one has uh, their specific role. So uh, the providers store the um, uh, data for the consumers um, and make it available at any moment. But in order to find the good provider, a consumer uh, will need to talk to a router with this indexer R. Uh, and of course, providers should advertise their, um, their records to the, to the indexer, to this router, uh, and uh, consumers uh, will, will query these um, content IDs in order to uh, find out what's the closest uh, provider for the data. Um, okay, so we want to do, do this uh, preserving privacy of the content for now. Uh, we are okay with the indexer learning uh, what uh, provider ID will, uh, w was the consumer looking for. Okay, so I will present you a bunch of cryptographic solutions or cryptographic protocol that seems to me close to, to this problem and may have interesting parts that can solve this. So searchable encryption, it's quite of an old protocol. Uh, there are many flavors. It's not completely secure, but it has some advantages. Um, so deterministic encryption for exact matching can be used to just compare data while encrypted. Um, we have some more relaxed uh, version of this, which just shows some property about two different ciphertexts. So this is um, property preserving uh, encryption. And order preserving encryption, which is kind of broken, I don't recommend it, but I just to, to be complete, I, I list it here. Um, so the drawbacks of such uh, solution is that, of course, they leak repetitions on, on the queries. If you query twice the same, the same content ID, then the, the router will see that because it's deterministic. Um, and there are some existing attacks in the literature that allows to recover all the data if we have many queries or if some condition are met. Um, but of course, hiding everything about the data implies accessing the entire data and communicating something in the size of the entire data. So we have a, we need a trade off. Um, another more recent uh, tool that we can use here is fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, these techniques allow to encrypt the data uh, in a such a way that further on someone can perform computation on the ciphertext and the result will be encrypted as well. So the one who has the secret decryption key can just take the result and uh, like this uh, ciphertext and uh, find out the result and nobody else. Um, so this offers nice privacy properties there is no interaction between the two actors when retrieving the data. Uh, but as we know it today, it's not that efficient for any kind of queries. So maybe for our basic needs, we can find something. Um, and, it, and it may have costly communication because if we want to hide everything, this encrypted result may be as long as all the database, like there we can find something as well. And what about the key management? It's not clear to me how we, we will ask for the providers to encrypt the data such that the uh, consumers have the secret key to find out the result. So that's, that's still not clear if we can use it in this way. Okay. Uh, we have multi-party computation, which is an interactive uh, uh, kind of uh, cryptographic scheme, uh, a family of interactive schemes. Um, and this allow for two or multiple users to uh, perform a computation on their personal local data without revealing anything about their inputs 
and learning only the outputs. So I thought that we may use this uh, in the context of uh, a consumer talking to a router uh, and ask them to interact uh, such that the communication is smaller than the entire database and uh, the, the router will not learn any inputs from the consumer. And here we can relax the fact that the consumer may learn more than, more than the data, more than the provider ID. It's still costly in communication and it has to happen synchronous. So that's maybe a drawback. Um, we have private information retrieval. Um, so here we have exactly this kind of setting where someone stores a, a database and we can query uh, just records without revealing what content from the database we're querying. Um, unfortunately, most of the solution required to replicate this database between different routers that have exactly copy, the exact copy of the same database and that are assumed not to collude in order to have security. So not sure that this is something we, we want to rely on. Okay, and the last one, which feels to me kind of closer to a solution, is private set intersection, but with special uh, uh, kind of size for the sets and uh, some labels because you want to retire more than just what you ask. So what's private set intersection in general? Um, here the consumer has a set S, maybe just one element. And here the provider has a huge, uh, no, the router has a huge set of all the uh, correlated data with the indexes. Um, and at the end of the day, private intersection will make the, uh, the consumer learn only if the intersection between their set and what, what is in, on the router side. Uh, and we want more, we want to learn the label with respect to, to the intersection because the intersection doesn't show, uh, show the consumer where to go to retrieve the data. So we can do that with private set intersection. Um, if we use private set intersection and fully homomorphic encryption, we can have small communication um, and um, may need some pre-processing, which is expensive for the router, but in order to have an online time during the query response that is uh, sublinear in the size of the entire database. Okay, so let me know if there are questions till now. I will go in deep in each of these solutions, so it may take a lot, long time. No question? Okay, let's start with searchable encryption. Uh, so index-based searchable encryption, it's a primitive that I think it, it has some years now. Um, and it's based on some uh, keywords that are used to search and trapdoors that allow the, the data store, the, the one who stores the data to, to decrypt the exact information that the consumer is looking for. Um, so each query allows for some par partial decryption. So more precisely, everything is encrypted here. We have the encrypted content ID. Uh, we have this we don't have yet until we have a query. And this is the provider ID, like where to find the data, which is still encrypted, but it can be decrypted when we have a query. So the consumer sends a trapdoor, which is actually a decryption key for this part of the table, for exactly that line. And the router can decrypt that and send back. And how it finds that? The, the consumer also has to send this uh, encrypted context, content that is a deterministic encryption and compare to know what line it should decrypt. Okay. So uh, generically, this has some leakage. Um, as I said, if it's static, we know the search pattern. We only see the repetitions and things like that. Uh, and in a dynamic database that allows for uh, updates, we can reveal even more to the, to the router. Maybe that's not a problem in our context. I think here we are safe because uh, it's the provider who up, uh, up, updates uh, the, these uh, records, so it's fine. Okay, uh, so now I try to imagine this uh, generic cryptographic protocol for our scenario. Maybe it's very simplified. Um, yeah, let me know what we miss here. 
Um, so we have the provider that has to encrypt their, their table of what they are storing. Uh, or those are all providers that put information in this table and send them to, but they have to send it encrypted. So each provider has to encrypt the content ID here uh, and with, with, or hash it with something that is deterministic so you can search, you can match. Uh, and uh, it has to encrypt the provider ID uh, in a randomized way. So it doesn't reveal anything for now. And it generates a trapdoor for each, um, for each uh, provider ID or content ID that allows to decrypt the provider ID ciphertext. Uh, router just stores the encrypted table and the query time comes, the, the consumer has to send the same trapdoor, which is used as a decryption key uh, for the provider ID column and the encrypted content ID with the same key and deterministically encrypted. So the, the router has to find this in the table and then use the trapdoor in order to decrypt exactly those, those lines in, in the table. So I see some problems here. Um, how can we coordinate between the consumers and the providers? So we have the same trapdoor. Uh, the encrypted content ID is done under the same key in some way. Um, or let's say those are hashes. We can solve that with hashes because it has to be deterministic and we never decrypt them. Um, so yeah, this can be hashes, but still uh, how do we encrypt the provider ID and obtain the, the trapdoor? So I guess if you see an obvious way. You could use the SID as a key. Maybe. Which one? The CID as the key. But then the router can do that too, no? So does the router get the trapdoor? I, I guess, what's the mm. difference between this and like the router returning the, encrypt, the encrypted provider ID? Oh. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. But then how do you decrypt it if you don't have the secret key? There need to be a key exchange yeah. in the middle somewhere. Right. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have an answer, but maybe you could use the CID, like similar to like the key derivation function that he was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. It's generally trying to the provider of the the index does not know the CID ahead of time, they know the CID from the provider. The provider doesn't know, or the, uh, the index are usually the, Yeah, yeah. It doesn't. So it can search by this column without knowing what search and then send back. Could, could we do that? the decryption on the consumer side, so uh, just retrieve all the ciphertexts mm -hmm. the consumer what was the one? But then we assume that the ciphertexts were encrypted with a key that the consumer has. Yeah. It's fine because it's the CID, but otherwise it has to be distributed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah do, do we keep both, both the company ID and the provider, provider ID on the CID? Content and provide on a. So in the first two at the very top, encrypt both the component ID and the provider ID based on the on the CID. Um, but this we should never be decrypted, and should be deterministic. And this one should be decrypted at some point. Yeah, I guess maybe encrypt that one based on a deterministic. Output from the company, so that the both the, but the provider then, and the consumer can agree on can have both arrive. Yeah. Oh, okay, but then anybody in the network wants to make it. Yeah. So, I guess another question I have here is: over time, does the router learn, like, slowly unveil the provider ID column? When it, like, gets yes, yeah, it will learn everything. Everything will become like 
in clear here actually. And it will learn how many times this were queried. Two times. Yeah. So this is like private until someone queries it and then the router knows. Is that correct? Or... Yeah. Uh, it's still private for the content ID in some way. Uh -huh. Right? Right. And could you republish once you have them open? Or yeah, no, it doesn't make sense really when you open it and that. You can re, re encrypt. You can change the trapdoor and re encrypt and send it again to the database, to the router, so the router doesn't know it's the same. If you are worried about your record being already in clear, I think that's an idea, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think there are, yeah, interesting things that we can look at here. It's not the best privacy guarantees in the literature because searchable encryption has like this leakage. So yeah, there are some attacks in the literature, I think I already mentioned. Um, so the search pattern is there, it's public to the router, uh, and also updating can reveal uh, stuff. Okay, here I had a list of other papers on this subject. Um, and I'll go to fully homomorphic encryption. So this, as I explained, it's a way to encrypt the data in such a way that you can publicly perform computation on the ciphertext on the encrypted data and you end up with the same result as if you have performed it on the clear text, but encrypted. So the, the result can be then decrypted by someone who has the secret key of the scheme. Okay? Uh, so the limitation of FHE is that we have to write up the computation as a Boolean secret. Um, and yes, that's sufficient, but maybe not the best for practice. Um, and also arithmetic secret more, more recently. And that's kind of makes a simple computation here I took like compared to integers of two bits representation into a big circuit. Like we need to evaluate this circuit over encrypted data. Um, and yeah, that's, that's not ideal in practice. So that's solve becomes like more popular as a problem and there are more compilers out there. So probably that's, that's a direction we can look at. Uh, and I wanted to present two uh, new schemes that may be interesting here. It's TFHE, which is uh, an FHE that allows for a selector gate which is not uh, usually the case in uh, FHE schemes. So we can evaluate this kind of gate uh, homomorphically, and this makes this comparing two integers of two bits um, less uh, expensive than in the Boolean circuit I was just showing you before. You do some, uh, yeah, you use this, uh, this kind of gate for comparing uh, bitwise uh, the, the, the components of A and B. And we have this circuit for the, for the computation. Okay, and we have a numerical method. It's uh, the scheme CKKS, that it's an approximate uh, uh, FHE in the sense that the result is approximate up to the 16 most sin significant bits. Uh, this is the like, popular value that they choose. Um, so actually it's just expressing some function as a polynomial uh, in order to be able to do only uh, like uh, arithmetic operation on, on top of the, the encrypted values. So you can approximate a function quite close to a polynomial and T decides the precision. So the degree of the polynomial here, T. So more precision you want, uh, bigger your polynomial is, like your degree uh, is higher, so you have more computation to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like in the approximation of this. Oh, the one, the, the other one, because uh, it's called Torus FHE. It uses some fancy Torus structure. Yeah. And those are the uh, names of the authors. I don't remember them. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, they're here. <laughs> here, the CKKS. 
Um, okay, so this is the landscape of uh, fully homomorphic encryption schemes. So first, like proof of concept, uh, forget about them, <laughs> they're really inefficient, but they were great uh, scientifically. Uh, and the modern schemes started like 10 years ago. Um, they become more and more performant, and what's impressive about new uh, libraries is that they optimize and they have these good compilers in order to make any circuit uh, very, very, like specific circuits uh, uh, very efficient. Okay, so I just recap uh, how we do a comparison, a simple comparison. The naive way with old schemes, the recent schemes are better. Here we can do one by one and you have nice, uh, uh, nice performance. Here you need to amortize because more you do together, like, yeah, less time you spend. If not for one, only one, the performance is not that great. Okay. And those are the libraries available. I think it's a little bit outdated. Uh, concrete, it's one of the most recent one and user friendly that you have out there. So it implements TFHE. Uh, okay, and it's in Rust. Uh, any questions? Mm -hmm. In the same way that we do exercise for structural encryption, oh, how yeah. will we do the exercise here? Uh, I prepared this at the end, but I will just use these gates actually. It's a like match, right? I'm saying, I'm giving you the integer A, which is my content ID encrypted, and you have all the content ID encrypted and I'm doing this. The, the router has a, if you have a later, just say stop. Mm -hmm. But uh, the router has a data, who makes the data to the router? The working provider, the client, um, that's a good question because the key, uh, like this key uh, management, I don't know how to do it because it's the consumer who needs to decrypt the result. So everything is encrypted under a key, under a secret key, and the secret key should be on the side of cons consumers. And I think there is a decryption proxy that we need there, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the question I think for this solution. No, but it's interesting. Yeah. If you can think of it, like there's a some sort of third party network. Uh, yeah, if we have that a decryption. Uh, uh, yeah. some content. Because everything has to be encrypted under the same key in order to be able to compute. Every key to the preference in every key, so you can do like. You have FHE with an FHE where you have some encrypted thing and you have somebody asking, could you please re encrypt that yeah. from a network private key to my private, to, to my public key or something like that? And so you have within FHE some re encryption. Yeah, yeah. It's called key switch, uh, but you need to publish the encryption of the key with the the other secret key that was used in the initial encryption. So I think it's, there is still some relation to the initial <laughs> secret key. It's some relation to these keys. Yeah. The initial key could be a full network key. Uh, sorry, oh, yeah. It could be a network yeah. key, but, um, because the network public key and the network private key that the, 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 the re-encryption network has, the router can run all the rest of the operations. That re-encryption network can be the switch. And then you ask the network, hey, network, or, or hey, uh, re, re encryption network, could you please re encryption the network private key to my key? Yeah. And then they give to you. Yeah. As, long as, a, as long as you have a third party, which is the network, where there is a key that is shared across these people, yeah. then everything's fine. But, 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 but what I'm saying is, it can, it cannot happen in a key. Yeah, it can. But yeah, the, the public information that you need is encryption of the new secret key under the, so I don't know who will perform that. Saying, yeah, the network, network, but you have to uh, keep uh, your key. Re key and keys with your key. If that could happen in an FHE, couldn't the client do it? No, because you need to have the Z secret of the network private key. Must, someone must have the network private key in order to do the resharing. But, but, but then that wouldn't be, a, that would be like MPC, right? Uh, well, I'm saying that you need some sort of uh, MPC. Or a single cluster node that really does the key sharing. Yeah. 
Otherwise, uh, someone needs to know some secret in order to yeah. share the arrow to get. Yes. <laughs> With a secretion. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> so it means that you would look up an encrypted CID? Yes, yeah. You will do everything that you will do in clear, but under on encrypted data. And so the DHT means that you could do, so you would have to um, compare somehow the, the, the peer identifier mm -hmm. with the encrypted content and to compare it together. But then if you find a peer that is relatively close to the content identifier, can you um, get back? The oh, you never see what you find. It, it doesn't have termination as in clear, right? You, you run blindly an algorithm on encrypted data, you, the algorithm gives you a result, one of these wires, but you will not know where you are. You will just see an encrypted result, and for you it looks the same if it was zero or one, or if it was successful or not successful. But during yeah. the, the, uh, the content routing, mm -hmm. you need to uh, find a peer which is close to the content ID. So how do you measure locality? So but this is not in the DHT where you, you imagine if you're um, an indexer. Okay, that's only for indexers, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's like a table that it's yeah. established is there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's no routing involved? No, yeah. Everything is stored by the router, the indexer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And MPC, the interactive solution I was mentioning. Uh, so how it works? We have multiple parties, they all have their inputs. We want to compute collaboratively uh, a function on all the inputs and to learn the result. Or maybe we can also distribute uh, parts of the result to some parties and others. And the goal is to preserve the privacy of each input here for the parties and the correctness of the computation, of course. Um, so the, like, the model for this um, is that you should have an uh, you should have a protocol that guarantees the same thing as if you had a trusted party in the middle that d does the computation for you. Uh, and in order to model it, it's like you have to to define all these like parameters. What's the adversarial power? It can be corrupting a lot of the parties or not. Um, is it adaptive or not? Um, the network model, how are connected, how the parties are connected between. If it's a star network, it may be easier than if it's like just random um, to have the meaning of the security for such protocols. So they are complicated protocols. The literature has so many flavors of them. Um, and the ones that are the most efficient um, use some pre-processing. Uh, and the pre-processing uh, allows to defer all the cryptographic steps, all the operations that are expensive to, to some offline phase where the parties are just uh, generating some correlated randomness between each other. So then the online phase, when you compute exactly what you need, it's very fast, it's, uh, it's performant, and the reconstruction phase decides if you give the result to some parties or to others, like that's, that's separate. Okay, so that's the general overview of uh, MPC. Um, and about the adversary. So adversary, it's like all the corrupted nodes in the network, in this network, the, in the parties. It can be passive, semi-honest, so it doesn't do anything malicious in the sense it follows the protocol, but it wants to learn more information uh, than he is allowed or malicious, so active, so it looks at uh, like the, the, the intermediate steps and change some value, it's not consistent with what inputs originally and change things on, on the fly in order to learn more information. And what we call in FHE, uh, in MPC uh, honest majority, is that it corrupts um, only uh, uh, a smaller fraction of the parties, like the minority of them, and this honest majority means that the adversary can corrupt more than half of the parties. Okay, also we want output delivery, which are schemes that are even harder to achieve because in, in this MPC uh, protocols at any point, the, if the adversaries are more than half of the network, they can just abort and 
uh, everybody, the honest parties will not be able to recover any result. So that's something that wastes a lot of computation and interaction. So uh, if we want output delivery, that meaning that the remaining honest party will be guaranteed to recover a result, a correct result, even in the presence of adversaries, um, we have some condition on the threshold of the number of the parties that can be corrupted by the adversary in the passive and active, um, active uh, scenario. I have a question. Yes. Are there scenarios where uh, the system is secure against the majority? But when you get output delivery, uh, the problem is that, like, in order to recover uh, in a threshold scheme, in order to recover the result, you need to have at least uh, t re partial results to put them together. So if those abandon, you don't get them. Yeah, they are no. Yeah, so that's the the abort uh, attack. Yeah, th those are the conditions. So that that's why I would believe this is the, the scheme we are looking for. We don't want to be like abandoned in the middle of the protocol and not have any result, right? Yeah, I don't know. So there are two ways to achieve, two main ways to achieve MPC. One is from um, uh, secret sharing. Um, so this is mostly designed for arithmetic uh, circuits, um, and uh, the like the difficult the efficiency is um, influenced by the number of multiplication. So that's the overhead, uh, more multiplication, so more rounds of interaction you need. Uh, additions come for free; you can compute them locally. Uh, okay, I will skip this because I'm going to too many details. Uh, and the second way to, to do a multi-party computation or more two-party computation originally uh, is by modeling your computation as a Boolean circuit and kind of encrypt all the gates in the circuit. Um, and this is a garbled circuit, known as that. And the limited factor is not the number of gates, but the circuit depth. So the... Mm, non uh, like uh, parallelizable gates. Yeah, I'll skip this. Okay. Yeah, any ideas so far for this one? So yes. if you have just like two people, like the um, consumer and the router, it doesn't work because you have to assume the router is like behaving honestly, right? Mm. Yes, yeah. No, you are the consumer, you are behaving honestly already. Right. Yeah. But uh, if the router like, behaves maliciously to try to get information, it could if there's just like N equals two. No, they wouldn't get all information. They would just, not, they would just uh, compromise the liveness of the problem. Yeah. So the so let's, start, let's start the protocol and then you wait for that. Like, oh, yeah. okay. They cannot make you learn something uh, fake. Like, yeah, they can either abort and you learn nothing. Okay. Either if you learn something is the good result. This is the guarantees of behind the MPC engine. I see. Yes. So like the failure here is like the liveness. It's not like yes. reading information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, oh, it's, okay. yeah, it's secure. If you use a, like a scheme that is proven secure, it's, yeah. So could you use, so like for routing, this would be like, you know, my input is like my CID and like their, the router's input is like the table. Mm -hmm. And exactly. I see, like we wouldn't, I wouldn't read my CID, I would just never get a response. Yes, yeah. But this is always the case because you can always talk to the router and the router can never respond to you. But yeah, yeah, yeah. My class, you always have this. But this is yeah. worse because you waste energy. Yeah, you, you talk till the middle of the computation and then. Yeah, yeah. So even, even today, when you, yeah. you ask to, uh, like, you, today you send this the list of things that I want, they uh, keep on talking to you and then disappear. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah it's the kind of same. So. Yeah, then we can afford like dishonest majority. Like if we don't care about the output. output the, yeah. Well, how would you do it? With two parties, one is the kind, one is the router, and yeah, the garbled circuit. 
if it, in this in this setting there are the other people like that who is yeah no the circuit is the search circuit yeah yeah i don't know <laughs> i think it's not the best solution <laughs> Okay, so next one, uh, private information retriever. So yeah, this is kind of closer to how our problem looks. Um, like the trivial solution for this kind of scenario where someone has uh, databases with uh, like uh, uh, different records and I want to query one of the record is to send all the databases. So what private information retriever tries to solve is to save on communication. Unfortunately, that was the focus of most of the work. Very recent work uh, cares about the computation on the size of the server. So all the focus was like making the communication between the, um, the consumer and the router smaller than linear in N in the size of the database. Uh, so yeah, here is the classic setting. Uh, we have the server who holds like uh, string x of n bits and uh, and we should imagine n very large and we retire one position in this string and without learning uh, without leaving the the uh, router knowing what what position we want okay um, so we have two flavors of uh, private information retrieval one is information theoretic which means that we have like uh, perfect sec uh, security. Uh, and one is compu computational, which means that we are secure only against adversaries that cannot break some hard problem. Um, okay, so the number of servers uh, in these protocols, in order to achieve better communication here, we need to distribute the, like to have multiple copies of, of the, the data. And here we can use only one uh, uh, router. Uh, communication is more expensive in the information theoretic part and uh, better communication in the computational one at the cost of some pre-processing in general. And some schemes I was looking at, um, for two servers we have communication in uh, of order n to a, a, a third here, uh, one over three. Uh, and um, for K servers, we have this communication and so on. And in the computational part, we have kind of better com communication here in O log N to the A, where A is some parameters that we can tune. Okay? Is there a way to have uh, information interacted with a single server? No, without communicating less than all, yeah. No, yeah. So what we use actually is that, that we spend some time on public key operation or pre-processing in order to, to gain this kind of communication here. Uh, and here we use the numbers of server and how, how they, they distribute the data. Uh, so there is a theorem of a lower bound that says that the expected computation for the servers altogether probably is like ON at least, uh, so not very uh, promising. Um, but we can do improvements via pre-processing, so doing some of the work offline, uh, amortization when we have many queries, um, offline computation, which is kind of pre-processing, yeah. So yeah, that's the hope. I think that's the open question. And in the computational peer as well, maybe finding better um, uh, assumption that gives better uh, communication. And this was extracted from some uh, uh, recent uh, paper at Eurocrypt this year. It has a nice like, view of uh, many, many protocols that solve uh, PAR <laughs> in different ways. Um, and in this work, it's here, the title, uh, they show some lower bounds for this setting where the client itself stores some data in order to gain, to save on the, uh, on the communication. So if you store S fraction of the data, 
uh, you will have to, you, you can have a communication of N over S. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, that requires the clients to also s store part of the records. I don't know if it's something we want. Um, yeah, and other variants of credit information retrieval that may be interesting. Uh, block PRI, uh, till now we were just asking one position. Uh, in a block PRI, we, we ask subsets uh, of positions. Um, and we can do it better than invoking a normal PRI in M times, M different times for M different values. Uh, robust uh, PRI, um, uh, this is uh, to prevent for false answers. So it's kind of like verifiable PRI. Um, T private PRI, um, even if the data is in this multiple databases uh, scenario, collude how to, to keep it private for a threshold T. And PRI with pre-processing that I was mentioning in order to save on uh, computation. Yeah. So I think that's the landscape here. Any comments? Well, I just saw Oh, I guess if we are okay with this amount of computation, it solves, but we, we are not. <laughs> yeah, so uh, can you go like one slide? Yes. Uh, there's one more. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, this one maybe? Yeah. So in the computational PIR, um, like some of those bounds might be, it sort of depends on what the constant is because you, this complexity might be fine if the constant is not too bad. That's the communication, but in this one, if I remember correctly, the computation is linear in the, so if, if we care about, like those are not the same scheme. Yeah, yeah. This is the best, the best in one word. On the order of, let's say, two, two billion records, or maybe more later on, but you could partition it. Mm -hmm. You end up with something like two billion records or, or 10 billion records or something like that. And so then it depends on that computation, like, how much that time is in seconds. But also, doesn't, do you happen to every single time or can you do yeah. it once? Is that pre processing step or is it something that every query? Oh, you know, no, that's every query, yeah. Query. yeah. yeah. Non pre processing. No, no, it, it, it can happen. Yeah. But it really depends on yeah, what the billing is. If that billing is just a scan for the whole thing, yeah. Yeah. that's more doable. I think before, yeah, exactly. What is the type of operation that this is generated? Is it just a, is it an addition? Or is it like a really big operation? Oh, it depends really about like in this computational mode, there are many different ones. So this quadratic ratio, this, this I know better, is like, um, it, it relies on RSA modules. Um, yeah. So we have. <laughs> one way for because it sounds like cash money. One way, yeah, yeah. I should look more on this one, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you use a mask, it'll be parallel. And this hiding problem is also on RSA, so yeah. Okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, well, you can't do this parallel either, can you? Just like, if you could, then you'd be okay. You can match. Uh, there is a the scheme that she has, there is a match PAI scheme, actually. And it's very, very interesting because what, what's going on is that you can take queries. I don't know if it's for multiple users. But oh. then you can use a user, you can take multiple queries. And yes, the only thing that costs one. Yeah. You may also be able to amortize this on. on a, this is the amortized one, yeah. On, on just having very large like, numbers. If you have 10,000 nodes, mm -hmm. they each handle like, a different part of the yeah. space. But that then the wheels are the same in the various states. No, I mean, it's the same. Well, but I think this thing is interesting because you can batch uh, multiple requests. If mm -hmm. you can batch mm -hmm. multiple requests from multiple users, it would be cool. So, but there's actually a practice you can turn it What? Why can't the server just then split their database into many databases and then just do your query against each database? At least you can do with what I'm saying. This is what I'm yeah. going to do. I'm just going to get uh, I'm gonna 1,000 things. Okay, so it's by public term, basically. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Wait, you have a question? Uh, like, if I give you a public database, you can't split that. But if I give you multiple, like, uh, after this multiple parties, you can just keep it separately. But we have no guarantees that the indexer is going to keep, uh, it could be that I show up as an indexer, and I only have one hash, and I only care about you, 
asking for the apps, and uh, the, this we can uh, we can uh, provide. No, but like, like it, what, what, so what if like like I'm a uh, provider, I, I store the data. Um, I create my index. Like, it, like, can you then take that and, and break it to pieces? It's not like like you have already finished. Oh, I think the router can have everything in clear, right? So th this is the question. Uh, no, the, the concern is that like like um uh, so like if I were to put the, the router like um, individual like separate pieces of my database instead of combining them, you just store them separately, mm -hmm. which means if you have to do a test against each one independently, to pick our like, fingerprint of like what we're looking for. But if I just like if I'm provider, I can do one big atomic database. That's a way to make this not work, but it's still. Mm -hmm. So you mean you not, don't need to hide the fact that that comes from only one provider? No, you said like you're going to use. The user asks for like 10 pieces of data. Yeah. Um, if I keep a bunch of, if I don't combine the sets, I have like many small sets from different storage providers, I can now think of the user based on which sets they're in, which sets they're not in. So I can refer to think of pieces of content. I'm saying, ah, this piece of content is in these sets. This content is in these sets. Now I can think of the user. So. Mm, yeah. Right. But it's a similar user knows that they can find that piece of content by asking in the internet if they go set. In general, the user will ask for things, you know what they're asking, and it would ask for many people, to many databases. And you will not know why they ask it here. But you know this this uh predatory time of the square root of m is one of the last few rows there, it's not bad. But this communication no, no, predatory time. Oh, per uh, query time, yeah, yeah. What do you see? Yeah, yeah. yeah the n, n to, yeah, square root of n, like that. But this is extra storage for the client. Mm. You need to look at it. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I was, we were always very excited to see this paper and then, ooh, <laughs> okay. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The client just becomes a rather. Yes, um, kind of. Well, this is the nice thing about the person that said, well, yeah. Maybe this works for when you are a router and you want to search in other routers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe you have a trust model where a client hires a router and you know, trusts the router and that router is kind of an EPM model, but you have multiple routers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, should we move on? Um, okay, now private set intersection using FHE. Uh, I was really happy to see the talk this morning of private set intersection because I have something very similar uh, that looks to me adapted for this setting. So what's private set intersection? We already saw a receiver has, like I will call them receiver and sender as in, in the original protocol, but here you can, Imagine this is with a big set is the router. Uh, so the receiver has a set, a small one, and the sender has a big one, and they want only to learn the intersection. Actually, only the receiver needs to learn the intersection. In the labeled uh, version of it, um, we have here like a set that may have the elements of the receiver and some label, which is the router, like uh, the no the uh, provider ID. Okay, so. We can do, like, instead of uh, looking at this table, we encode it as a polynomial that has nice property. We interpolate in such a way that the polynomial evaluated in each of the elements of the set will have the, the exact label as a result. And what the receiver will do will encrypt their query, their element of their set, send it encrypted, and because I have a polynomial, which is a function and a fully homomorphic encryption scheme, I can now evaluate this polynomial that is of degree my, my set size in the encrypted values from the receiver. And what I obtain, exactly the label corresponding, but encrypted. So I obtain encryption of two, right? So this is a costly, operation because it's done on the on encrypted data and it costs as much as the set uh, length right but it works and now I, I will show you how to optimize okay we send back the encryption as I said we have the secret key that's a problem that we have to look at 
for the key management and we decrypt the exact label we needed. So let's see a little bit of computation here. Uh, it's ON, as I said, the size of the set. Uh, the depth of FHE circuit with some, uh, with some variant of this where we send multiple powers of A, log N powers of A, we can go to this kind of uh, uh, depth of circuit. Um, the communication is all log N because receiver will send this log N powers of A. And if we don't need secret privacy, which means that we don't have to protect the sender against receiver, the receiver, so the receiver learns a little bit more, uh, we have better uh, FHE parameters, so we can exploit that. Um, okay, so these are the values from the paper that introduced this. Um, they chose a receiver with a set that has 5,000. For us, it may be one query, I don't know, like the, the values here are, and this is the big set. So these are the performance, the running time and the communication. FHE, uh, PSI, it's in the order of O, N, log N, so if N is one, it's O, log N. Communication. Communication. Yeah, log N? No, no, let's see megabytes on that. Because of the ciphertext, yeah. FHG ciphertext are not light. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here I'm asking for something like a few bytes. <laughs> Where can I find this, like one kilobyte? Here's it's, a four megabyte. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not iOS, I don't know. It's like... I just want to make sure that we don't know what it is. This can probably be, like, you can have a content writing structure where you have very large collections that you put into different places, and then you're doing routing to those collections, and you kind of do this tiered structure where you first do some kind of routing to find where, mm -hmm. where to go, and, and you, that way you shrink the set there. Your set is no longer billions, it's like thousands or something like that. Um, and you do that for that for some of them first, you arrive at that connection, and there you later do some other. Some other it, it, would be, it would be interesting to see what's the communication that it is made by. Because, I mean, in this case, maybe we're encrypting 5,000 things, and maybe they're Yes, yeah, yeah, they encrypted log N of those. Log N of ciphertext are sent. So what's log big N? Yes, log B, big N, because they want to help the sender do a smaller computation, so they have some powers of the, in order to evaluate the polynomial. So well, yeah. how, many, how many powers does the receiver need to send? You can tune it. You can send just one, but then the sender will have to compute uh, an evaluation of a polynomial. It has to compute all the po consecutive powers up to the set size in order to evaluate a polynomial. We've arrived with some scheme where you have you know, something like a thousand forums around the world, and you place content in those forums, and then you do the routing separately from your field. You first, do, you first find which forum it's in, and then you go there and you scroll out. So it's out. And that could actually work, like the constant scheme might actually work out really well. Um, and with a thousand rounds and like that, you can sprinkle a load of that. You can have low latency communication to that so the rounds don't matter. Um, and if those rounds have like an 18 or something, a few days, is it? You can move through that. And you like CDN, it would be kind of like partially encrypted CDN plus um, right. But at this point, I don't know why this improves on the prior information of the scheme. Yeah, I mean, I'm saying it's... Oh, sorry. What was your answer to uh, anchor to my question? What, what does that improve? Uh, what, what does this improve over the prior information of the scheme? Uh, much more transparent. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's <laughs> <just> security. <laughs> you know, it's okay. But, no, sorry, but I have a, a small improvement. Like. I have a cuckoo hashing. <laughs> so if we don't want to compute a function that has degree the size of, uh, of the set for the sender, we can use cuckoo tables where we pick some, uh, some hash function and hash and place the elements in, in, uh, in our set in a table according to the result of this hash. So this hash gives you the index where to place the hashed value a. So here it's for h1 will go to 3, h2. And the receiver will do it just once. So the receiver will have just to hash their 
set and just like mixing it in a, in a table with these indexes by picking at random one of the hashes. Or like H3 here will bring the A to the fourth position, H1 to the second for the B and so on. And the cuckoo comes from the fact that of course there, there are collusions here uh, because of how it works. So what we do when N is sent again to the second place, uh, we apply the cuckoo technique so we like uh, give away uh, the, the previous B there and pick another hash for it, H1 was two, so H3 and put it in the first and we reapply it at it. And there are some uh, theorems that it, this will always finish if we pick as many indexes here uh, bigger than the, the size of the receiver set. Okay, so what do we save here? We have to compare B on the first, the encryption of B, we have to compare it only with the first line. And we are sure if, it, if there is in the intersection, it will be in the first line because of course we use one of the uh, hashes here and here we use them all. Yeah, and this is a polynomial of uh, really uh, like lower degree, uh, the degree of uh, how many hashes, like how many elements we have here on the line and in each line we have for example, if we used three hashes, three um, divided by the number of indexes, and we can pick more if we want to have a good ratio, times S, which is the original set size. Yeah. Sorry, I have a question. Use the default input and encrypt. Are you expecting? Yeah, this before. Because if we do some composition per line and not for the entire for the entire thing, then you're getting some information about which line you want to um not necessary because this is very redundant, right? Like the way you arrange so information. If I don't have line one, there's not eight. So if I if I'm asked for line one, then it's clearly not. Yeah, but you don't know if the result will say match or not. Yes, and also you don't know what hashes were pick and picked by the other. Like, yeah, th this doesn't reveal anything. Yeah, it's just a way to like set that data structure. Yeah. So yeah, I guess if we use this in combination with the FHE uh, private set intersection, yeah, how it works. As I said, the lines are functions which have the lower degree than the, the set, but we have four of them. And we evaluate F1 only on, uh, on the first ciphertext, F2 on the second one, and so on, and send the result for the decryption. So can you ask me again, why, if you ask me, why, why would you want to ask me for a line that's not line one if I'm asking for A? So I look where A is here, and I'm saying, oh, it's in the forward line. So I will tell you, compute me the forward function evaluated on this yeah. to know if your if my A is at on your table as well. And if it's if it is, yeah, you will find it on the forward line. Okay, but then if it's if not, I, if, if then me as a send as a index server, I know that you're asking for the fourth line. Now I don't know which of these letters you're asking, but I know that you're asking for one of these letters. And I know that you're not asking for N over N, B. So I can try to figure out what you're not asking for. Oh, so I see what you mean. Okay. So you either do the completion of the entirety of the table, which it would be super big. Yeah. But I will ask all the line anyways. Yeah, you ask for all the lines. You ask for them. You ask for all the lines. Because the lines are actually the number of, uh, yeah, I will ask. Okay, you, you, yeah. you always compute yeah. all the functions. Yeah. You and you, you send cipher if you even if you don't want to know about B you have to encrypt some zero and ask for it yeah yeah and this is smaller in terms of communication uh yes yeah in, in te no it saves on computation okay so but the communication of is the same but the communication was good anyway because it's just cipher text okay F H E cipher text. <laughs> Is that, 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 is that
Oh, the the way I think was to already uh, encrypt powers of of these values, as as I was saying, like you encrypt powers of a. So what they have to do is just to exponentiate to have all the consecutive powers to evaluate a polynomial. Yeah. No. no I agree, yeah. But those are a lot of ciphertext you have to send. Yeah. yeah. What is it encrypted with? Um, FHE. So the the ones the benchmarks I had where um, I think with some BV, BGV or something like before the TFHE, before the concrete library. So I will assume that like newest FHE will work better. Yeah. I will assume that if you try to implement these schemes with TFHE will be better. Can yeah. you just use parents? Then you can do a lot of set intersections up with just parents. You don't have any encryption schemes based on pairs that does multiplications. As you will have to communicate as many powers as yeah. the yeah, yeah, to evaluate a linear function. Yeah. But if we are fine with that, yeah. Maybe you can do a compute Yeah, the compute tree to to make it smaller. Yeah. yeah. I have a question, which is, uh, I'm trying to understand the comparison between this and the variable information policy, mm -hmm. which I think a variable policy is overall more efficient kind of communication, and we don't have to have any really have to worry about key management. Yes, that's true. And it seems that this is like, you need to worry about two things that you don't have to worry about the other side. Actually, this label one is a very particular yeah, case. Yeah. I want to do like private commercial people on doing business so that if you have good communication, uh, you have to do key management. Oh, right. oh yeah, to, to have a data structure. I didn't check that out, but there may be something. Yeah. Um, I didn't get the information to the privacy issue. Can you go back a couple slides where you do like add, or where you talk about the following? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so, where is this? So, when they encrypt A, mm -hmm. what's the key that is used? Like, does the provider have to have this key when they encrypt A, or is it just the key on the receiver side? FHE is user, usually a symmetric key, but you can easily transform it into a public key. So it can be a public key encryption, but there will be a secret key for the decryption somewhere. But when the router creates the polynomial F, they don't need the key at all, right? Oh, no, that's super independent of any encryption that happens, yeah. Well, so the router doesn't uh the router necessarily because this set is like defined by what table they have here it doesn't require them to know the table yeah, yeah but the router knows the table like that's a pre-processing thing of course when updates happen this should be redone, like compute uh, the polynomial. The polynomial is just defining this uh, computation that reveals intersections. I was talking earlier, like, I think this is how we get the privacy, because like, if I create this set, I can just create like, as many sets as I want, and then just test your request against all different sets. But you don't have the response is yes or no. Yeah, you, you, you just compute blindly, you get encryptions that look the same. Oh, I see. Each time you send back a reaper, like an answer, it's just a uh, ciphertext. Yeah, okay, so you need both rounds, actually. Yes, yeah, you, you don't have your se the secret key, you can never go back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, conclusions. I think we had many, many nice comments during the, the presentation so this is like kind of all the stuff we can use out there 
more uh, less sophisticated and expensive in communication and uh, computation. So yeah, that's that's my talk. This is awesome. Thank you. I think that we need a better access for this slide, and, uh, and the access should be the uh, requirements that we want to solve this problem. And as you recently said, I think it, what they were a little bit clear, but they could be even clearer. And so, for example, we talked about proven computation cost or the communication complexity uh, of like uh, the size, problems. the complexity of the size, for instance. I don't think they imagine with the, the, the network, uh, how many packages do you send? Should, and also around complexity. Okay, so, for example, are we having people around terms of communication using the indexer? I think it would be great to define a bunch what of is a, what is a multi dimensional space. Right? So, there's yeah. probably like six different things, and then we can maybe come up with a table that ranks a bunch of these. Um, and then use that feedback approach to be like, oh, this one is pretty good. Yeah. It would be great to, to see what we, what what are the parameters that we want. Yeah. Well, what if this is something that is absolutely not possible? Yeah. So I think that the first version of this are going to be like terrible, but good enough. Yeah. Yeah. Or to go to each scheme and to say this is bad, we should look at these parameters and improve it. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you.